Okay, welcome everybody to our afternoon session. So I very enjoy, very much enjoyed the other two talks with a very broad perspective and with a clear medical implication. So my talk will be a bit more specific, a, a bit more basic science and with a few potential clinical applications. So don't expect that I perform now systems medicine, but you will at least the bridge between basic science and modeling and biochemistry is already a challenge and at least here we can contribute some experiences. So as Jesper introduced, uh, science is now done in, in teams, interdisciplinary teams and I might use the opportunity to introduce some of my co-workers. So Grisha studied physics in Saratov, Russia Barat studied engineering in India. Christoph is a physicist from Bielefeld. Patrick is a master student in bioinformatics in Berlin. Paul studied biotechnology in Stockholm. Achim is a biochemist. Adrian uh, studied physics in Argentina. Anja studied biochemistry in, in Ljubljana. Samuel is a mathematician from originally from Canada, now in Lyon. And Steve Brown is the epigenetics expert from the US now in Zurich. You see, even the core group of my team is heavily mixed. Ne? And that's why we need to understand each other and we have to complement our experiences, our experien experiences. Okay, the talk is a connect. Uh, uh, Say a series of some short stories, all of them related to modeling and experiments and some medical applications. I will have a lengthy introduction since I'm aware that few of you are experts in circadian biology and chronobiology. By the way, thanks David that you mentioned chronobiology in your talk as a kind of outlook. This is, was very fascinating to be seen in the same, on the same level as personalized medicine or something like that. So it's but it's also my opinion that this is a kind of hidden resource we have to explore and that's why it's good to have it here at the very first meeting. Ne? Perhaps for the next meeting you might uh, invite Francis Levy and then he can discuss similar issues with a more medical perspective in a year or so. Ne? So this might be a good idea. Now in Warwick, so it's also convenient. Okay, then I have a one slide story about a disease, a family advanced sleep phase syndrome two somewhat larger stories about modeling genetic networks or chronotypes and at the end I give you just a snapshot of how chronobiology can contribute to optimizing chemotherapy. So this might be expanded next year by Francis Levy and I will show some of his slides in fact. Okay, let's start. So many organisms evolve the circadian clock. Since we have a 24-hour day and night cycle in most areas and we have a lot of Zeitgeber, light, entrainment, food and these environmental oscillators entrain our intrinsic clock. So we have a system of coupled oscillators. And regarding my background, my background is more nonlinear dynamics, the dynamical systems, chaos theory. And that's why I do not show large scale models, but small scale models, but with a, an interesting dynamics. So this is another say, view to uh, medical, biomedical, biological systems. But I enjoy chronobiology a lot since I had to learn physiology. I had to apply bioinformatics, genetics to understand the core clock. So that's why it's uh, an area where, you, where, that, where I can learn a lot and contribute a bit. And my contribution is mainly associated with coupled oscillator theory, since I will show in a minute that the circadian clock can be regarded as a system of coupled oscillators. But here again an introductory slide. So all of us uh, feel the circadian clock every day. So we have a lot of markers, deep sleep, low body temperature, melatonin as a kind of sleeping hormone during the night or alertness or some say now you might be a bit tired 
so uh, muscle strength, body temperature, and so on. And there are a lot of physiological implications. So for all many or many processes, there is an optimal time, particular for sleep and heart diseases are also associated with blood pressure and specific times of the day. And here's another list of, say, dysfunctions where the clock is involved. And these are serious issues since mood disorders are strongly associated with sleep problems. And it's hard to say what is the starting point. Do you get first a depression and then you have problems in sleeping? Or perhaps the other way around might also be a kind of cause and effect issue. Yeah. And cancer will be discussed later. And metabolic disorders is perhaps one of the most obvious links, but it's difficult to study since it more or less connects a huge area with another huge area, but it has a lot of promising ideas. So this is how chronobiologists view the circadian clock. So we have some cues that uh, give us the phase or the timing. They are in humans, it's mainly the retina that receives the light. Then we have a central pacemaker. And this is the most essential point that the circadian clock in most organisms is autonomous. So we, we have an oscillation even in a cave or in a bunker or even at the North Pole. Or so that's why we have a circadian clock, by the way, of about 24.3 hours. So it's a, this clock, uh, the period is a bit longer than 24 hours, but it is uh, trained if we get enough light. And then there, there are multiple outputs I mentioned already. And the physiology is heavily oscillating. So I mentioned already melatonin as a kind of sleep hormone, but it's it's also up during the night in mice. And as you know, mice do not sleep in the night. They are active. So that's why the term might be a bit misleading, but it's still used in human physiology. Say cortisol is up in the morning. Tem body temperature is changing a bit. 0 0.5 degrees in us and perhaps 2 degrees in mice. So these are very convenient markers to, to quantify the intrinsic clock. So later I will show some data from the Zeisler group in Boston and they uh, measure typically the uh, human clock by, c by disturbing the external cycle. So they have 28 cycles or other cycles in, in their lab. And that's why they do not really feel is it outside dark or, or bright. And that's why the intrinsic rhythms still persist. So melatonin and body temperature, that's why they can measure the period of individual persons and then they get numbers like 24.3 hours plus minus 0.2 in populations of about 100 volunteers. And the pacemaker is a tiny area in the hypothalamus, the so-called suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN. And these are just 20 to 100,000 neurons that act individually as oscillators. So in every of these neurons there are genes expressed that can induce circadian rhythms of gene expression. So we have here a coupled system of thousands of oscillators driven by light input. So here, for example, my expertise is helpful that I have experience with coupled oscillators. And I asked myself when I learned there are 20,000 oscillators with periods ranging from 20 hours to 28 hours, I asked myself there should be a lot of chaos. And since I learned in the 80s, if you couple oscillators two or three, then you expect chaos. So the, some of you might know the new or real Tarkin the uh, theorem that three oscillators give rise to chaos. And this was not observed experimentally. So I asked myself why 20,000 oscillators weakly coupled do not give rise to chaos and splitting. Yeah. And we have some preliminary answers, but I have not the time to discuss it today. But we might discuss it in the evening over beer if you are interested in chaos in the in the brain. In fact, at the end of my talk, there are some extra slides on splitting and chaos in the brain. So, so you will get them. That's why if you are interested in chaos, then just look at these slides and contact me. Okay, but we will continue with the introduction. This is my favorite slide since it's 
shows the connection of physiology, of genetics, and say modeling, engineering systems, biology. So here this is a, a, a hamster running in, in a running wheel, and if it is feeling light and dark cycles, then it's very precise, starting to run every evening when uh, darkness starts. Ne? And the surprise comes if we turn off lights, then we have constant darkness, DD, and then still the hamster starts to run very precisely every evening. Uh, but the start is shifted by half an hour per day. So that's why we can immediately conclude there is an autonomous limit cycle oscillator, a very precise oscillator, but the period is a bit shorter, about 23.5 hours. This is the typical period for rodents. Uh, uh, and if we go into the details, then we might f find homologs of the Drosophila clock, like period 2, and Joe Takahashi discovered clock, and uh, others BML1. So these are some of the clock genes that are typically expressed on an mRNA level during the day, subjective day, uh, but the proteins are typically expressed or have their peak a bit later, six, seven hours later, and then they start to inhibit their own transcription, at least some of them. No? And this is a delayed negative feedback loop symbolized here. So you might say X is the mRNA, Y is a cytoplasmatic protein, and that might be the nuclear complex inhibiting its own transcription. And when I first discussed with Arim Kramer, a biochemist, uh, this kind of conceptual model, then I asked him, why d how do you get six hours of delay? Since I learned from Michael McKee, if you have a delayed negative feedback oscillator, the delay should be in the order of one quarter to one half of the period. So you need at least a six hour delay to get a, a say, 24 hour rhythm. Yeah, and he was not aware about this mathematical result. No? Uh, but at the end, he is now studying a lot the delay, how the delay is controlled by phosphorylations, by complex formations, and so on. So we had the same question, but f he was approaching it from the phosphorylation, protein, complex formation, and so on. I was approaching it with a, with a simple model in mind with delay differential equations. No? And then we met and have a lot of interesting papers together. So here it, it's obvious that there is a very clear question where the delay comes from, how is it controlled, no? where you need a lot of data to answer that simple question. And in Drosophila it's almost solved. No? So if you observe per and tim no, uh, proteins, no, then they are transcribed, translated, and then they wait 5.5 hours in the cytoplasm. And then they split, go to the nucleus, and, and inhibit their own transcription. So that's why in Drosophila we know the delay is nuclear import. In mammals it's different. So all genes go immediately to the nucleus. So th but all these clock genes form huge complexes. No, and all these, most of these clock chains are phosphorylated. So we know phosphorylation, complex formation, nuclear, uh, nuclear shuttling matters, no, but we do not know details. No. And this brings me to the first short story, the family advanced sleep phase syndrome. So this is a story about the family advanced sleep phase syndrome. There was a family in Utah and a chronobiologist observed them and found out, yes, half of the family go to bed at 7, 8 o'clock in the evening and get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And then they uh, sequenced the clock genes and found a point mutation in period 2. This is one of the clock genes and this point mutation is not allowing phosphorylation by casein kinase epsilon. Uh, so this is a single point mutation leading to a very extreme phenotype. And this also shows that, say, one gene can influence the phenotype a lot. Uh, and then Achim Kramer, a biochemist, he established the, the, the model system in, in cell lines and used temperature entrainment to measure phases and, and amplitudes and periods. And he found indeed, uh, yes, the phases earlier in a mutated cell line and the period is shorter. And then he could go on in this cell line system, what are the mechanisms? And he found out, yes, the wild type, PER2, has a long lifetime of uh, several hours. Yeah. The mutated one has a shorter half-life. Half 
Uh, so that's why this phosphorylation controls stability. And from a theoretical point of view, we know the long-lived proteins are more lazy. So they have a peak a bit later. So the, the shift of the protein level is almost proportional to their lifetime. That's why we have already one reason to have delays. And then Katja Vanzelo, she studied also nuclear export and import and found out that nuclear export is also influenced by this and other phosphorylations. So we got two mechanistic ideas how to uh, explain this phenotype. But Achim found by inhibiting kinases sometimes short periods, sometimes long periods. And that's why he asked us, can you explain us with modeling how we get short and long periods by inhibiting phosphorylation? And then we simply translated what he was telling us to a simple 5 ODE model, model. So with X, this is the mRNA of PER2. Z is the nuclear inhibitor inhibiting the transcription. But Y is now a non-phosphorylated PER2, weakly phosphorylated PER2, and heavily phosphorylated PER2. And, and they measured degradation rates uh, and, and nuclear export-import. Uh, so that's why we could fit more or less their data to such a toy model. Uh, and these five equations are easy to solve, to simulate, and we could reproduce short and long periods. And from our understanding, we could also predict some tests. Uh, so it's, it's a toy model. So it's far away from the true complexity of the system, but it helped to understand some, some data. Yeah, and by the way, it's a single gene model. And in a minute you will see the single gene models are, seem crazy knowing the complexity of the circadian clock. But if you have an appropriate model, then you can explain a limited amount of, of data. So sometimes toy models are helpful. By the way, all models are wrong, but some are useful. This is a very famous quotation, and this is really the heart of our modeling. So we look all the time for the right level to, to answer a question. So typically we have first questions yeah, and then we ask ourselves what kind of a data of a variable, what is needed to address this question. Yeah, and then we look for minimal models that uh, are data-based but have, uh, can help us to understand the problem. But these say toy models cannot answer the questions at the end. So then we need again experiments to, to answer the real questions. But we can predict some experiments, some good ideas to, to go on with experiments. So this is the circle described earlier today. Okay, now I switch to, to a different question. So how to model the core oscillator? So I have argued the clock is ticking in every cell. It's a transcriptional translational feedback loop. That's why we can also use genetic networks to describe the core clock. And I, you have seen one model of a single gene. Uh, now you see a bit of the reality. This is a uh, recent review of Ueda and, and colleagues. And this is about a minimal core clock system. You see it looks complicated, but it's still reasonable compared to some other networks, since the key elements are cis regulatory boxes. So E boxes, D boxes, and raw elements. Yeah. Raw elements are driven or inhibited by nuclear receptors. Here are five out of 48. Yeah. D boxes are driven or inhibited by D box binding proteins, or E4, BP, BP4, or NFIL3, TEF, HLF, quite important also in, in toxicology and in, in, uh, metabolism. E-box regulation is a bit more complex and that's why we have activating transcription factors. BMIL-1 forms a dimer with clock but NPS-2 can substitute clock in some cases. BMIL-2 is some redundancy. But there are also these famous inhibitors that inhibit transcription via E-boxes. And the most popular ones are the cryptochromes, the period proteins, DEC1 and DEC2 are also transcription factors. These are stoichiometric inhibitors. So they also could bind to E-boxes and in that way they inhibit transcription. And then, as I mentioned, phosphorylation matters. 
so we have here kinases, uh, lifetime matters, so a lot of E3 ligases oscillate uh, in, in our cells. Uh, so there is, this is not the end of the network, but this is a, the common sense of these genes all have a phenotype. So you might ask, what is a clock gene? What is a core clock gene? And the common definition, if the phenotype is severe, if you have a significant change in period, or if you can uh, turn off oscillations, then this is the core clock gene. This is a practical definition, but then you might add another 10 or 20 genes that have a mild phenotype. So that's why it's it's open to expand this network. Okay, this is a challenge for someone loving differential equations, but it's getting even worse if we look at E-box regulation itself. So this is the typical lifetime of an E-box. So there are, this is a, these are profiles of chipsec experiments of all these players. No? And I might guide you through the, so at time zero, uh, BML1 has its peak in the M, its mRNA expression. So then it's finding its partner clock binding to E-box promoters or to E-boxes, functional E-boxes. And around at CT6 times 6, they start to transcribe with the help of histone acetylases uh, the first immediate early clock genes. So this is the peak of expression. And so here it's a bit later, nascent transcription for some of the genes, but the earliest ones start already here. And then some of the targets like cry per one and per two are inhibitors. Yeah, so they bind later as a BML1 clock uh, a dimer. Yeah. And that's why inhibition starts during the, during the night. Yeah. But there is also a late inhibitor, cry, cry one. So it's also expressed by or regulated by e-boxes, but it's surprisingly late, but very important for the dynamics. Yeah. And he has not chipped uh, other factors like HDEX3 and CERT1, so also histone deacetylases play a role. So it's not a complete story, but it's already complicated and interesting enough. And he ignored raw elements and D-boxes in this figure. So this was a study of Joe Takahashi, now in Texas. So it's a amazing complexity and hopeless for, um, say, ODE models that are quantitative. So that's why we have to rest restrict ourselves and now I will describe how we tried to to reduce the system to a kind of enhanced or enlarged toy model. So we realized that we need activators to drive the system. And two of them are included in our 5 gene model, BML1 and TBP. We need inhibitors like PER2 and Refab alpha. And the late inhibitor CRY1 was shown to be also of relevance. That's why Many of the other genes are somehow redundant. And some of the activating genes are out of phase of the inhibitors. So that's why we can say, for example, with Refab alpha, we can also mimic the action of Roa alpha beta gamma, since they are activators and are out of phase. So just by fitting the transcription regulation constants, we can mimic, say, some other genes. So it's not really a reduction of the system. It's still most of the regulations shown before are included. So then, for these five genes, binding sites have been studied very carefully. And if they are studied by at least two groups, then we included binding sites. So degradation rates are available from different cell types. So at least we have an idea what is the lifetime of mRNAs. Yeah. Uh, then from protein data we have a fee or, or chip sec data, we have a feeling what might be the, the time difference between transcription, translation and action. That's why this is not too bad, but transcription is, is hopeless to model quantitatively. That's why we fit more or less some of the remaining parameters to transcriptional profiles. So, so altogether, this is not a biochemically correct quantitative model, but a model that is a kind of toy model, a minimal model, but with a, with a reasonable procedure how to find parameters. 
and that's why we can at least learn from the model. Okay, this is a snapshot on the binding sites of these genes. In the 6-gene model, we had included also raw gamma. This is now removed in our 5-gene model, since it's more an output. And, and you see some genes, like BMIL-1, are regulated primarily by nuclear receptors. No? Others are heavily driven by E-boxes, like DBP or PER2. And CRY1 is the most interesting gene driven by all three types of elements. And that's why also the late phase is achieved. Okay, here are some of the raw data we used for fitting the remaining parameters. So Anya was doing a lot of qPCR data with very careful normalization with housekeeping genes and got different waveforms. And you see some of them are quite sinusoidal, no? like BMIL-1. Others are more, more sharp, DBP and RefERB, for example. No? In fact, the discovery of DBP was funny. So Uli Schiebler, the famous transcription regulation biologist, he was discovering DBP in some cell lines, probably liver. Uh, and, and the next poster couldn't reproduce the results. Uh, but one of the postdocs wa was a morning lark and the other one was a night owl. Uh, and uh, at the end, DBP was not visible at some point, but clearly visible at other times. And then Uli Schiebler switched or included chronobiology into his interest. So, he, he, so this was a good uh, story regarding progress in chronobiology since he contrib contributed a lot. For example, seeing the clock in fibroblasts is one of his achievements and so on and so on. So he's really a major driver of the field. Okay. And this is now our model schematically. These are experimental data. So you see the phases, the amplitudes, and even the bandwidth or the, the waveform uh, from these arrows. You see that the core clock is relatively cons consistent over different tissue. Here you see liver and adrenal gland, but it's true for 12 other tissues as well. You see phase relations matter, so you have a certain order of, uh, of regulation. And at the end, we can construct tissue-specific or even more general, say, small models. And other models included protein forms, phosphorylations, complex formation. Then, but we had too many free parameters. And that's why at this stage with Anya, we decided, okay, our expression data are very solid. Uh, our lifetime of mRNA is well understood and we have a feeling for delays. But we have not enough good data for protein dynamics. And that's why we decided to switch from ODEs to DDEs, to delay differential equations. So this 5-gene model is, has just 34 parameters. So 5 delays, 5 lifetimes, and 24, say, transcription regulation parameters, including all the inhibitions and activations. So it's really a kind of minimal model. No? And you see several regulations are ver that are very well documented. So black, the activations, and, and red, the inhibitions. So it's more or less a representation of Ueda's schematic diagram. No? So it's still a toy model, but now we can ask questions to, th to this model. Since it's plausible, it's not unique, there are surely thousands of other models that are as good as this model. No? But it's at least well justified. Here is, for example, the question how data compare with the model. So the agreement has been achieved by uh, some evolutionary opt optimization algorithms, as usual. No? And there are indeed different minima, and we compare parameters and redundancy and all these issues. I do not discuss. You see, it's very good. And you, here you see one of these equations of the 6-gene model. And you see there are very few left parameters. The Hill coefficient is related to the number of boxes. And then you have just two parameters in the act transcriptional term and, and the lifetime and the delay. So it's really a re strongly reduced system. And still, we have problems to analyze it. So the problem is not that we cannot solve these equations. This is easy. There is enough software. But the problem is 
how to understand such a network. Ne? And this is, by the way, a very deep issue. Uh, what does it mean understanding a network? So it's, and I have no easy answer, but at least I would understand if you can simulate it, this is the very first step. No? But at least I do not know what is the core of this 5G network. No? So there are, for example, Refab Alpha and Beamer 1, activate inhibitor. This is a negative feedback loop. And the phases are appropriate to get self-sustained oscillations. No? The most popular feedback loop is from BML1 to PER2 and the corresponding inhibition, so here shown. No? This I modeled already in, in the other FASP story. No? That's why there are multiple putative generators of oscillations. And, and I asked the student, Patrick Pett, please do reverse engineering of that model. He's a, bio he's a bioinformatics student and this seemed to be a fair question. Tell me what is the most essential feedback loop, what is the most essential regulation? But here I show something else, but it's somehow related. So I asked, now this student had the idea, this is again the 5G network, had the idea, let's uh, clamp all these regulations. Yes, so let's replace, for example, the inhibition of DBP by PER2 uh, by putting the, the term to a constant mean value. So that's why he more or less kills the regulation, but keeps the, the mean levels, the regulations. And then he asked himself, is the still system still oscillating? Uh, and then he found, for example, the two-gene model of BML1 and PER2, uh, Refab Alpha here. This, gene, this system is also oscillating with almost the same parameters. You had two and one parameter. Then he found the three-gene model, even without tuning of parameters. So there are multiple different solutions. That's why we have no clear answer. No. But then, as a bioinformatician, he d started to do combinatorics. So he asked, okay, if I turn off 17 regulations, then I have altogether 2 to the power 17 or 131,000 different models. How many of them oscillate? Quite a bit, 14,000. No. But then he made a table, how many or uh, what is the frequency of a specific regulation in all these 14,000 models? No? This was more or less what you suggested. No? And some regulations are sometimes helpful, others are surprisingly frequent. No? And then it, he found something that is, was exciting to us. He found there's a binary picture, so most of the regulations appear from time to time, but three regulations were necessary all the time almost all the time. And this is a, was a new network that includes both, say, known uh, feedback oscillators, Refab Alpha oscillator or the per cry oscillator. So it was including three genes that have to be considered before as two different loops. Uh, and obviously you need also the constant activation of BML1. This is necessary, but it's, it's already known that if you clamp BML1 to its mean value, the system is still oscillating. And now we, and you might recognize this is a repressor So it's a very famous basic system of a negative oscillator. Now we want to write up the paper to convince all the readers and reviewers that the repressor is a good candidate. No? We are not sure that this is a true model, but at least going back to the literature, if we look for knockouts that kill the clock, no, then we find Refab Alpha, Beta, Cry1, Cry2, and Per1, Per2. So at least these three players are, seem all to be essential. And if we are naive saying Refab Alpha is the only driver, ne, then it's hard to explain why these knockouts are uh, killing the clock. Ne. And if we say, okay, this is just an auxiliary helping loop, ne, then it's not so obvious that this double mutant uh, is not non-rhythmic. So at least these observations are consistent with our, say, surprising finding that uh, there is a repressor hidden in the system. Here I simply summarize what we did. So five genes are quite good. DDEs are mathematically helpful if you have not enough data on intermediate steps. Uh, transcription regulation is difficult, but fitting helps. And there are now more candidates than before to 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 look for core core clock. No. No. 
but we it could be also true that say the network picture cannot be reduced meaning in a meaningful way this is, this is your idea is, is still relevant okay this would be the end of genetic networks here are some term terms that are important so phase of entrainment so we have a system of two coupled oscillators the sun and ourselves uh, and the relative phase is quite important since all of us are synchronized to 24 hours, but some of you are morning larks, others are night owls. Uh, and this is a phase of entrainment or chronotype. Uh, so then I will just mention strong oscillators. So if you have single cells like neurospora or, or lung tissue with not too much coupling, uh, then these oscillators are easily entrained. You can entrain there with 20 hours, with 28 hours, since they are somehow strongly driven by Zeitgebers and do not resist. Ne? On the other hand, the SCN, the superchiasmatic nucleus, is a strong oscillator. So it's a network of coupled oscillators and, and it's continuing oscillating if you turn off lights. So that's why it can adapt slowly after jet lag. Some of you might have jet lag, ne? but it's quite robust. Uh, so this is a strong oscillator and the entrainment range is much narrower. So we can entrain to 22 hours, 26 hours, but not to 20 or 28 hours. Uh, this might be important uh, for understanding some of the next slides. Okay, so we can do experiments in slices, in, in cells. So here are, for example, different conditions to to drive fibroblasts and here you see a phase oscillator is a bit naive since you might have amplitude changes under different conditions. No? So here is a, a result slide from comparing lung tissue and SCN tissue and here you see the SCN tissue is strongly coupled and cold pulses have no effect. So the amplitude continues to decrease and the phase is remains the same so it's a strong robust oscillator no? the lung is more flexible it has a kind of resonance effect so it's increasing its amplitude no? and the phase follows the cycle the zeitgeber no? so that's why we see there are different types of oscillators and then a referee asks okay if this is true for 20 hours it should be also true for 28 hours no? and then we had to repeat all the experiments again no? And, but at the end it was submitted and we were quite happy that everything was fine also for 28 hours. No? And at the end, so also the phase depends on Zeitgeber strength, this I skip. But I keep this figure. So now we can do a theoretical picture. We can plot the entrainment range as a function of period mismatch and Zeitgeber strength. No? And and we see the SCN is a strong oscillator, has a narrow entrainment range. So we can detune it by just two hours. No? The lung or neurospora is a weak oscillator and you can entrain it easily also with 20 or 28 hours, even with a medium Zeitgeber strength. No? And this triangular picture might be known to some of you as an Arnold tong. So it's very well known in, in the theory of coupled oscillators. So if you have Zeitgeber strengths and mismatch of frequencies of periods, then you get such a triangular shape. And this guides us a lot through, through the biology of the of circadian systems. And let's keep that in mind. Here it's again a summary. Entrainment, what does it mean? And here you see the distribution of humans. See, they are larks and owls, as I repeat in a minute again. Then there was a question is it in our genes? If you are a night owl, is it, uh, say, uh, since you are working so hard and so long, or is it in your genes? Uh, and that's why Steve Brown and Achim Kramer convinced a, uh, uh, some uh, a medical doctor to ask his patients, these were mainly patients with depressions, so we excluded later seasonal affective disorder, and some of them were extreme night owls, others were extreme larks, and they delivered some skin cells and Steve Brown was measuring periods and phases of these skin cells and found a moderate correlation between intrinsic period and 
and the uh, morningness or uh, lark and owl discrimination. So at least partly the, the intrinsic phase or the chronotype is in our genes. Okay, now the, the other question. Our periods have a very fixed period, about 24.3 plus minus 12 minutes. But the chronotypes are much more diverse. This part might be due to other factors, amplitudes and lifestyle. No? But even if we assume that they are related, we could ask why can a small change in intrinsic period, like 12 minutes, lead to a 1.5 hour earlier waking up? No? And this is a serious question and, and we can address it again with modeling. So for a strong oscillator, we have a narrow entrainment range and a quite strongly changing phase. Now for a weak oscillator, it, the entrainment range is large and the phase is not changing too much. And here you, we add to the Arnold form the phases. No? And you see there is some systematic behavior, so 12 hour changes within the entrainment range. And this is no, not by chance, but this is mathematics that I will skip. So it's a saddle node bifurcation of limit cycles. It can be reproduced in complex models. It appears even in damped oscillators. So I skip this mathematics. No? But I uh, show you that this discussion makes a lot of sense. For example, even in different animals, you see typically a 12 hour range of phases. So here the entrainment phase is plotted against the period mismatch. No? So And then you see a short line means there is a small entrainment range and the large slope means it's steep. So you have a lot of ch changes, of changes of phases. So the theory from Arnold Tong pictures is consistent with a lot of data collected by Ashoff. So this is, and now we more or less understand the strong oscillator is robust in period, but very flexible in phase. And this is pure mathematics in a sense, no, but interestingly also consistent with a lot of observations and quite relevant since it explains the phase flexibility of us. And here's again shown if you have a strong oscillator, say in vertebrates, then you have about a slope of four. So a change of 10 minutes uh, in period leads to 40 minutes of uh, phase. No? But in Neurospora and other organisms with a weak clock, they have just a one-to-one -one ratio. So if you, have if you are one earlier faster, then you have a one hour earlier phase. And the last picture in this connection is the Arnold onion, as we term it now. So if we are in Sweden, then we have in summer very long, long days. No? But in winter, we have very short days. And this is an extra parameter, the photo period or the day lengths. No? And we know that phases are sensitive. And we, we can model that and can explain a lot of features, how say in some animals the phases lock to midnight and other animals they lock to the morning or to the to the evening so this is another free parameter photo period that can change the phase and the period as well okay this was a summary of the entrainment story you should take this home that you need daylight to to get large amplitudes to get less depressions and perhaps even to reduce your cancer risk. And since there is good evidence that if you have shift work, ro uh, rotating shift work over several decades, then you increase your breast cancer risk by about 35%. Okay, now I have a few slides on chronotherapy and it's perhaps fair at this meeting to, to keep them. Uh, so, uh, but then we have a lot of time for discussion, uh, still t a few minutes for discussion. Is that okay, or do we want to discuss chronotypes at this point? Yeah. So another question regarding chronotypes. Okay, then, or if you have some, then keep them. I will just show you the the next level of complexity. So I explained to you we have a pacemaker in our brain. It's not really a pacemaker, then, since the liver clock is also self-sustained, also very strong. It's more in conductor orchestrating the, the, the concert of clocks. No? So we have clocks in every tissue and interestingly these clocks are quite different 
in their outputs, obviously, and they are regulated by food and by light to a comparable strength. And as uh, Francis Levy has shown, at least in mice, it's very clear that there are optimal times of delivery of cytotoxic drugs. 5-FU was mentioned earlier, ne? Ne? but this is also true for other drugs. Ne? And in fact, he applied chronotherapy to about 3,000 colorectal cancer cases ne? and found interesting results. So the main result is side effects can be reduced a lot. And this is safe and statistically highly significant. Ne? Lifespan is not much expanded. This is uh, bad news. In particular, it's not expanded in women, but a bit expanded in, in men. This is not understood yet. Ne? But side effects matter a lot ne? from a patient's per perspective. That's why it's already a, a big advantage. Ne? And it can be improved that since at this stage, we have to use mouse data to predict optimal phases for patients. Since it's ethically not possible to try patients with less optimal phases. That's obvious. So that's why we have to somehow predict optimal phases from mouse models. This is obviously uh, not so clear. Uh, since melatonin, for example, has an opposite phase compared to the phase, uh, uh, or has the same phase as humans, but this means an opposite phase to the activity cycle. So it's non-trivial, but most of the other markers, most of the other genes change 12 hours. That's why it's fairly reasonable to assume opposite phases for humans. But I have mentioned one experiment where the LPS shock ne, said it depends a lot on the perfect phase. Ne, and if you have a patient with anesthesia ne, hospitalized, ne, then you never know what is his phase or her phase. That's why there is still a serious issue if you apply chronotherapy. The good news is that the, some of his students had portable pumps, so they got treatment at home. And this was another advantage, less side effects and treatment at home. So there is really a fair chance to Im improve the life of patients, perhaps also their lifetime. But we had nevertheless started to simulate it, and here is a simulation where we simulated a chronotherapy, and there was an advantage if the clock was turned on, so red compared to blue. Ne? And then Samuel Bernard did a much more large-scale study how the therapeutic index can be improved. And he colored, say, the surviving normal cells and the surviving cancer cells differently, calculated the ratio. And at the end, he got such plots. And blue means pure therapeutic index, red means good one. And you see what I already mentioned. If you treat patients with a period of 24 hours, then you can gain a lot, but you can also lose a bit at least for fast-growing tumors. These are fast-growing, these are slow-growing tumors. So that's why there is a risk to have the wrong phase. And then you lose uh, this uh, chronotherapy. And this has been shown in mice models. There was an experiment uh, by Ruszewski that if you have the wrong phase, just four hours off, ne, then you kill 80% of the mice ne, compared to 20% percent at the right time. So these simulations are again from a kind of toy model, ne? but including say apoptosis and S phase duration and these details, ne? and that's a cell based model. Ne? Ne? But at least the model makes a clear prediction if you go to longer periods for a fast growing tumor, ne? then you still gain a bit, but there is no risk left. Ne? And this is shown here, you get you gain, but you gain less than with the 24 hour therapy, but at least it's safe. No? And this is even for a physicist very plausible. If you entrain with, a, with a, a period, then you get resonance effects. These effects might be strong and even perturbing. No? If you drive with, a, uh, with another period, then you might still gain over five days some of the good, fa uh, good effects, no? but it's perhaps safer. This is at least a very preliminary application of modeling to, to CRP design. And we, we have to discuss with Francis, how is it reasonable to try it? 
uh, what kind of improvements have to be done, but he's also using other mathematical, more detailed models to understand better the effect of different drugs. Okay, this is something I have not spoken about. I have not discussed coupled SCN neurons, and I have not discussed different tissues. This is just one slide to convince you that there is a lot to do. So these are the phases of clock control genes. Most of them peak in the early morning. Yeah. These are the phases of clock control genes in liver and adrenal glands. They are a bit more similar. Yeah. This is the core clock, and I claim the core clock is not so different. Yeah. Why clock control genes are totally different in phase and also in overlap in different tissues? This is an open question. I have no clear answers. This might be associated with driving signals like leukocorticoids or autonomous nervous system. My feeling is it's more tissue-specific transcription factors that co uh, cooperate with, uh, with the core clock. Uh, you mentioned the competition of e-box binders. I'm sure there are some e-box binders no, somewhere here. HIF1 alpha has also a kind of e-box, very similar to an e-box. CEBP is close to an e-box binding, ATF6. Ne? So this might be one reason that the highly expressed other nuclear receptors might change the output genes or cooperativity of, of core clock genes with tissue-specific genes. This is my best guess. Ne? But there is a lot to do to understand these patterns. And these patterns, again, are related to physiology of these issues. So from a physiological point of view, the core clock, the clock control clock control genes should be different since you have to control different processes in different systems. No? So that's why it's not surprising, but I would like to understand also a bit more the mechanistic links. Okay, and I finish with all the questions I am personally interested in, and I started with, in my point of view, the question is the most important starting point. So you, you have, If you want to model something, you have to specify your problem. Uh, and then you can select appropriate models and then you can ask for for data and so on. It's not a good idea to collect over five years a lot of data and then to use any model. It's good to start from the very beginning to formulate a question and then to uh, design models and data generation. And, and one model we discussed how the core clock work acts and we have no final answers. So I have skipped SCN heterogeneity and also the orchestration of peripheral organs since I have only limited answers and it's not so exciting to discuss only problems. We discussed control and entrainment phase. There yeah, we have a good, say, mechanistic understanding, but no details. And obviously the most important question here is what is the normal function of a clock or what are the most essential normal functions? There are many of them. Yeah. And what what's go what goes wrong if you have no functioning clock or if you are hospitalized and so on and so on or if you age this is also a hot debate ne? all factors that are associated with aging are clock regulated so that's why aging and clock are linked a lot and this is a work of Paul Westermark from the ITR Institute. And he has exciting data on, on expression profiles in different tissues. And now he starts to understand the link between aging and clock. Okay, there are no other urgent questions. Then we have sun and coffee. Thanks.